Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Welcome to today's message from Harvest Chapel International. We believe the message will be a blessing to you as you imbibe God's truth. God bless you. Indeed, God, there is none like you, and there is no place like you. Your word says that it's in you that we live and move and have our being. We thank you, God, for a time like this in your presence. We pray that your word will bless us tonight. It will illuminate our hearts, our minds, and it will cause us to move even for you as we reach out to save the lost at all costs. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, I don't know how many minutes I have. Is it? Okay. Thank you. So this month we are doing, our theme is winning the loss at all costs. Winning the loss at all costs. And... Um, when you say winning the loss at all costs, it means that there's no price that is too high for winning the loss. Amen. It means that even if it's at the peril of our lives, we are winning the loss because it's at all costs. It means that no matter what it costs us, no matter what it takes us, all our energy, all our time, all our strength, all our money, whatever it takes. We are saying that at all costs, we are winning the loss. Amen. Do you agree with me? It means that we are taking every opportunity that we get to reach out with the message of salvation. It means that we are not waiting for evangelism month before we reach out to the lost. But it's something that we are doing all the time, whether it's convenient or not, whether it's comfortable or not, whatever it costs us, we want to reach out to and, and, and touch the lost with the um, gospel of Christ, the message of salvation. And it's, also, it's so easy sometimes to think that the work will be done, whether we get involved or not, or the work is being done. That we are all, we are a team or we are um, fellow laborers in God's vine. Yeah, God is depending on each and every one of us. Wouldn't it be funny if um, half a team showed up at the football field and the other sat back and said, oh, some people have gone to the field already, so the work will be done. We know that they will be beaten seriously. Amen. Because everybody was not there. Or can we imagine a workforce, Barclays Bank, one day just half the workforce will go to work and say that, oh, some people have gone, so we will stay back. And uh, the work can still be done, will still be done, will still be finished. The work will not be done that way. Amen. And so in the same way as they have a football team or have the workforce or even have an army cannot go to battle the same way we as the army of the Lord everybody has to take his sword his word his tools and go out there and join the workforce and do God's bidding amen we, we said um, the song the first song they say that that we want to do God's will, ready to do his will. And so at all times, you and I should be ready to do God's will. And um, our theme verse, which is 2 Corinthians chapter, eight, chapter 5, verse 18, 19, it says that God has given you and I this message of, or this ministry of reconciliation, which is restoring people back unto himself that is the ministry God has given us 
that we, he will use us to restore people back to himself. After reconciling us to himself, he's using us, he's calling us, he's pleading with us, imploring us to also um, reconcile people back to him. And um, it says that all this is from God, from verse 18. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation verse 19 that God was in God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation he has committed that message of reconciliation to you and me meaning that he has entrusted it to us he's put us in charge in charge of it and so it's people that you trust, that you entrust um, work to. And when it's entrusted to you, it's because God believes that you are a faithful um, person. That's why he has entrusted such an important thing to us. So he says that he has committed to us that message of reconciliation. And we know that that's God's highest desire, restoring people back to himself. Excuse me. Restoring people back to himself is God's highest desire, his greatest pursuit, is his heartbeat. That is what God desires above all things. And that's why he went to such lengths to bring his only son to come and die for us. It cost him his all. And so if we say that we are winning the loss at all costs, we are just emulating God. That's what he did. He did it at all costs. Amen. And so this is his greatest agenda for us. And he's depending on you and me to fulfill that agenda. Re reaching the lost with the gospel. And it's so important that as you go through the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and even in Acts, God has stated this clearly, this mandate, this command clearly in each one in the most famous one is Matthew 28 19 and 20 which says that go and make disciples somebody has said that there's an impelling go in the word gospel he says go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit and then he says teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you so the Great Commission is not just going and telling people about the Lord, but also teaching them. It's a continuous thing. That's why I said we should make disciples of all nations. When you read Mark 16, 15, he said to them, go into the world, another go, and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 24, 47, he says that, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations repentance and remission of sins should be preached that's another challenge god has thrown to us that we should preach the repentance and remission of sin when you read john 20 21 jesus speaking to them said as the father has sent me i also send you and we know what mandate god gave to jesus in, in, in Luke 4 18 when he said that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor etc etc amen and the last one in Acts 1 18 but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the world the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, when the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost primarily was that we will be witnesses with whatever gift God has given us the motive was that we we will receive power to be his witness to give an evidence of that which he has done in our lives through Jesus Christ amen now our question tonight and I'll be hope I'll be brief is that what does it take to feel God's heartbeat and to pursue this agenda to win the loss at all costs 
what should be our posture how is it supposed to guide us what are we supposed to do to make sure that we fulfill this very important mandate that god has given to us and um first of all i'd like to say that each one of us has to be personally responsible we have to take personal responsibility for this mandate that god has given to us soul winning is not an option it's not something that we can decide to do and or not to do it is it's not a, it's not a gift of the holy spirit amen so that we know the gifts of the spirit some people have this some people have another one this one is not a gift of the spirit neither is it a church um, program for church growth amen it's a mandate that god has given to us to reach out to the lost the end result of course will be church growth but that is not the reason why we are going out amen we are just fulfilling a divine agenda a personal agenda that god has given to every christian and that includes you and that includes me amen it's a command it's an assignment it's a charge it's a commission for each and every one of us and um rick warren who wrote the purpose driven life i'm sure we all know about this is that jesus doesn't only call us to come to him he also calls us to go for him amen so as we come to him we need to go for him and reach the lost with that same message which touched us and which brought us to where we are today god holds each and every one of us responsible and accountable for the souls of men ezekiel 3 18 says that when i say to the wicked you shall surely die and you give him no warning nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity by his blood i will require at your hand yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness nor from his wicked way he shall die in his iniquity but you have delivered your soul amen so that's the charge that we have god is going to hold us accountable and so we need to be focused on god's agenda if we want to win the loss at all costs and take personal responsibility and hold ourselves accountable for the souls of people that we have interacted with shared with walked with slept with eaten with done so many things with and the only thing we have withheld from them is the most important thing you know i heard this story about this um old lady who uh, a pastor and his family befriended so she became like the grandmother you know of his children in and out and each time all along he kept wondering how am i going to you know talk to this lady um about christ about salvation about the need to, to know the Lord and all that. And as the years went on, it became harder and harder, more difficult for him um, because they, they had become, you know, so close. But one day he, he decided that he would put everything aside and that whatever was holding him back and then talk to her. So he spoke to her and then she asked him, so have you known this all along? that we have been friends have you known this all along that i need to get saved and if i don't get saved i'm going to hell and be there forever and he said yes and she said i don't want you i don't want you to be my friend again just leave my house and go because i don't understand how that you knew all along that this if i had died i would have gone to hell and you never ever told me about the gospel about the way of salvation and this is a true story and so people when we when we speak to them and they know the consequences of not accepting christ that's what ezekiel is saying and they go to hell then god is not going to hold us personally responsible 
But as long as we are going in and out with people, and we are saying this is the most important message that we have, and we don't share it with them, then um, if God is calling us wicked, then we deserve to be called wicked. Amen. But I don't think any one of us here is wicked or would like to be called wicked. And so if we are saying that we're going to save the lost at, in, at all costs, then whatever it costs us to share the gospel with people who we are so familiar with, we ought to and we need to do it. Amen. Because a sense of um, responsibility will cause us to have compassion for the lost because we'll know where the lost soul is going. And when we read the Bible, we can feel the compassion of Jesus. A lot of the things, in fact, all the things Jesus did, it was because he had compassion for us. And when you read Matthew 15, 32, um, talking about the feeding of the 5,000, he said that, I, I feel compassion, or um, I have compassion for the people because they've been with me for three days without food. Matthew 20, 34, this, the Bible said that he had compassion for the blind man and he healed them. But when we come to Matthew 9, 36 to 38, he says that, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Amen. When he saw them, he was moved to compass compassion because he did not just see people he saw lost souls. He saw people who were doomed in a doomed state. And he saw a harvest ready. So he told his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send our laborers into his harvest field. Amen. So we need to also see them the way Jesus saw them. He saw a people. They may have been happy chatting and all that but he saw them as sheep without a shepherd he saw them as harassed and so sometimes with the people we are with they look very happy they look very okay glamorous maybe wealthy famous and all that but we need to see with the eyes of god amen we need to see their state we need to see whether they are on their way to heaven or on their way to hell because that is the most important message that we can give to anybody we also need to have a sense of compulsion um, an irresistible urge to do something you know or behave in a certain way when you read first corinthians 9 16 the apostle paul said for when i preach the gospel i cannot boast since i'm compelled to preach I'm compelled to preach. I'm compelled to preach. The KJV says, necessity is laid upon me. Paul was driven by a strong desire, a strong drive to do what God wanted, to do what was the heartbeat of God. So he said that I'm compelled, I'm pushed, I'm forced. I cannot do anything. I'm compelled to preach. And he goes on to say, woe is me. If I do not preach the gospel, woe is me. Those are strong words. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. I'll be greatly dis distressed, miserable. I'll be grieved if I don't preach the gospel. And these days, very few of us have that kind of woeful feeling, if I can put it that way. And even if we do... Our lamentation is not for souls. Amen. I can just imagine us, including me. Woe is me if I don't get married. Woe is me if I don't make some money. Woe is me if I don't have a child. Woe is me if I don't get a car. Woe is me if I don't have a house. Woe is me if I don't travel. I don't get a visa and travel. Winning souls is not on our list of woes. But Paul says that, woe is me, woe is me, 
if I don't preach the gospel. He said, necessity is laid on me. I'm compelled to. Something is driving me. Something is moving me. Because I believe that in his mind, this, this, this was all that there is to life. Whether people were on the narrow road that leads to life or on the broad road that leads to death. Just these two things. That was the compelling force that drove Paul to do all that he did for the Lord. Amen. Because when you, when you read um, Luke 12, 15, it says that a man's goods is, does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. That we seem not to think that. We think the opposite. You know, and so we want this and we want that. We need this and we have to do that and make sure that everything is okay with us. Then we can see to um, God's business. But Paul said, woe is me. Woe is me. And for him, it wasn't just a mere pressure or obligation to do something. It was born out of a deep-seated love for God. When you read 2 Corinthians 5.14, it says that for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. Everything Paul and the others did was to honor God. And God's love controlled them. Another word for constraint is control. They were controlled by the love of God and what God had done for them. And so he said that if one died, then all died. And he died for us so that we no longer live unto ourselves. So that we no longer please ourselves. So we no longer only chase things that will make us comfortable that will make us better, but things that will accomplish the work of God, the mind of God. So we need to have that sense of compulsion and allow that love that he has shown us to compel us to um, reach out to the lost at all costs. And um, we sing this song, It's only God who has done all that for us. And so we want to give ourselves back to him. We want to ask him to take all of us and use us whichever way, whether we feel like it or not, whether we are comfortable with it or not. God wants to use you. God wants to use me. He knows what he has placed inside of us. And that's why he has entrusted such an important thing to us. Amen. And so when you get to verse 16, he says that, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Or regard no one after the flesh. It says, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. I think the NLT says that we have stopped evaluating people from the human point of view. And that's really the point that I want to make tonight. And each time I stand here to talk about reaching the lost, this verse is not lost on me. If we, we need to stop evaluating people from the worldly point of view. How nice they are. How beautiful they are. How rich they are. You know, how high they are in status in the, in, you know, in the, in, in, the, in the nation or wherever they find themselves. How educated they are. How prosperous they are. All those things are passing away. The world and its desires are passing away. But he that does the will of the Father abides forever. It's only God's way that is going to abide forever. And that's going to decide which way we are going and where we are going to spend eternity. And that should be something that should be uppermost in our minds every single day. It shouldn't be something that we are prompted to remember. Whoever we are with, whoever we meet, we need the mechanic that works on our car, the clerk at the bank that we deal with. We meet so many people at the salon. People do our hair. 
what's the first thing that we discuss with them outside of the work that they are doing? We should be concerned about the souls of men and women and where they are going to spend eternity. And as Ezekiel said, once we do our part and take personal responsibility for it, God says he's not going to require their blood from our hands. Amen. We also need to have a sense of urgency. And when we talk about urgency, we are talking about time. And when we talk about winning the lost at all costs, we don't have time. Amen. We are actually working against time. So we need to have this sense of urgency amongst us, I mean, on us. And not, we can't afford to procrastinate, in other words. Ephesians 5.16 says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Another way she says, making um, opportunity, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Making the most, making the most of every opportunity. So, um... The days are evil, and if we don't have a sense of um, agency and do something, we know that people will be consumed by the evil. Even now we are speaking, there's so much evil in the world. And we, having been sent out as the light and the salt, we are supposed to reduce the evil, dilute the evil that is in the world by winning as many people as we can to the Lord. Amen. In um, John 9, 6, 9, 4, Jesus said, As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent. I must do the works of him who sent me, because night is coming when no one can work. Night is coming. So there is an agent, agent work to be done. There are so many things that we can call our night. There are some countries that are already in their night. You can't preach the gospel. Night has come for them. There are places where there are restrictions. Death can come either to us or the people in their sins. That is night time. Sicknesses can keep us on our beds and we can no longer go out and talk to people. Anything can happen that will restrict us from sharing the word, sharing the gospel. Anything. And that, Jesus said, the night is coming. And no one can work. So we must work whilst it is day. And every day and every time, every hour that God gives us is an opportunity that we have to make use of. Amen. Millions are rushing into hell as the days, weeks, and months go by. And when you read Isaiah 5.14, it says that hell has enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. So many are going in. There was somebody shared a vision about seeing hell and people just, you know, dropping in, in masses, in loads, in droves. And um, we sing the song, souls are parting to eternity. How many really will die in Christ? And how many really will live in Christ? When you read the NLT of that same verse, I, um, Isaiah 5.14, it says that the grave is licking its lips in anticipation. And you know, you know when you see some juicy food or I, those of you who like chocolate and ice cream and cake, I won't look somewhere. When you see it, your mouth start watering and sometimes you start licking your lips, you know, unconsciously. It says that the grave is licking its lips in anticipation. anticipation. The grave or hell is waiting for people to come, ready for them to come like food. And we need to rise and do something about it. We need to talk more about this. We need to reach out more about this. We need to let people know that this is the agenda God has given to us. It's not enough to accept Christ and come and sit in church and warm the pew or warm the chair. God has a mandate for us. When you read Matthew... 633 says that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things will be added unto you but these days we seem to have turned that verse around seek all these other things the things that the heathen are looking for before we come and care about God's kingdom 
They say that when we seek all these other things, all the things, when we seek the kingdom, all these other things that we need, that God knows that we need, you will add it unto us. It's not about seeking them in a godly way, different from the way maybe an unbeliever will cheat to get a car. Maybe we will try to get a car and a house and a wife and a husband and everything, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in a godly way. But that shouldn't come before the kingdom's work. Amen. Our hearts should go after God's kingdom, seeking and to do what he desires, what's his heart beat. And when we do that, he says all other things will be added unto us. 1 Corinthians 7, 29 to 31 says, still talking about the agency. He says, what I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. Amen. And so that, that habit and that posture of guarding what we have, of wanting more, building more, doing this and doing that. He says, pretend that it's not happening. Even if you are married, let the kingdom come first. Amen. And pretend that you don't even have those things because they are passing away. It's just like water being poured away. The world in its present form is passing away. Whatever will be left is whatever we have done in the name of God. Whatever we we'll see as our trophies at the end of our lives is not how many um, cars we bought, how many houses we built, and how many children we saw through school, and how much money we had at the bank. They'll all be nothing. It's only the things that were done for the Lord that will stand. Amen. And I'm just reminded about the, I think it's 1 Corinthians 3, right? It talks about the foundation has been laid and we should watch how we build upon it. Whether we are using straw, wood, hay, um, precious stones, gold, and um, silver. It says that it will pass through fire. And I think, um, I think Dr. Pope on Sunday preached on that. That is the judgment that we as Christians are going to have. It's not about heaven or hell. It's about what we did in the name of the Lord. Is it going to stand the fire that is going to pass through? Amen. If we win souls, they are going to be our trophies. But lastly, I just want to say that we, we need to have a sense of eternity. We should be driven by eternity. We should be eternity-minded people. We need to keep eternity in view. And always remember that we, haven't, we are not going to live um, forever here. We are going to live forever in this world. But where we we'll live de determines, is determined by what we have done here. Somebody has said that this is a dress rehearsal for us. So the people who are passing us each day and we meet, they, 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 are also, they also have an eternity to reckon with. It's not just us. And we should be concerned about where each one of them is going to spend eternity. Fulfilling the Great Commission is the only thing that has an impact on the spiritual destiny of other people. And so, that's the most important thing that we can get involved in. Amen. And um, when you read John, um, I think it's John 3, the Peter and John were going into the temple. They met this man at the beautiful gate. Peter said, silver and gold we don't have, but what we have we will give to you. Amen. And that spoke to me. We have something that we can give to, to solve people's problems in this life, the greatest of which is their salvation. Amen. 
and we know the answers we know the solution we have the power and god has given us the mandate to do it and he says that he's going to be with us always as we do his work amen and so if he wants our life to be worth something for eternity then this is what is god's heartbeat and doing this work is what will give us a deep sense of fulfillment because we are dealing with the souls of people there's so much joy when um, you go out to evangelize and you bring the lost in and you see them also grow to do the same thing that you were doing there's so much joy in it in acts chapter 20 paul had the same um feeling about this mandate that god gave to us in acts 20 we know that he was on his way to jerusalem as a prisoner he says that he doesn't know what will happen to him there but the holy spirit tells him that everywhere that he's going prison and hardships waiting for him but he was still trudging on and in verse 24 he says that however i consider my life worth nothing to me my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the lord jesus has given me and what is that task the task of testifying to the good news of god's grace that was paul's main concern the heartbeat of god he said that otherwise my life is worth nothing to me and we need to get to that place that we haven't done anything we haven't accomplished anything until like him we testify to the good news of god's grace we bring the lost in we 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 obey god's mandate the reason why he sent his son to come and die for you and to die for me amen and i pray that in this month it will not just be for the month but it will be with us forever that wherever we go whoever we see whatever we are doing the thing that is uppermost in our minds is seen beyond the physical the people that we interact with and reaching out to them it has to be something that is part and parcel of our lives we can't just do it now and then no hell has opened its mouth wide the devil is not doing things now and then he's very very aggressive trying to get as many people as possible into hell that god is depending on me and he's depending on you in this month i want us to promise ourselves and promise god that we are going to do all we can to not just to reach out but to come to that place where we'll have our mindset will change our posture will change our attitude will change if by 31st august we haven't even won a single soul but our posture has changed so much that is going to affect us for the rest of our lives when it comes to soul winning something good would have happened to us amen and um, as i speak to you i speak to myself also that our posture will change that should be our prayer and i want us to just rise up as i come to the end of my very short message i hope that we will also come to this place of finding the secret to living this life of significance that is the life of significance when we feel god's heartbeat and we move along with it when we stop evaluating people the way the world sees them when we see the urgent need that is around when we attack with all urgency when we feel compassion for the lost jesus felt compassion for the lost so much that as they were crucifying him he could say that father forgive them as stephen was being crucified he said the same thing father forgive them and so when we see beyond the physical we are able 
to even forgive our enemy have mercy on our enemy and wish that he he or she will also come to the saving knowledge of Christ let's just pray at this time commit ourselves to God's hands this is just um, 3rd August very early in this month let's pray that God's spirit will touch our hearts not only touch us the fire of the spirit will torch us it will burn us burn in us that like Paul we will have will feel that compulsion that we will, will be able to say that woe is me woe is me what is your woe tonight does it have anything to do with the souls of men and women or it has to do with your comfort your convenience your next step to prosperity God has entrusted this to us let's pray pray for yourself that you'll be useful a useful tool in the hands of the master that's the most important thing the most important work that we can do is not standing here to preach reaching out to the lost that is what is dearest to the heart of God it's so dear to his heart the Bible says that when a one sinner is saved there's rejoicing in heaven there's pa a party in heaven over one lost sinner and that's why the good shepherd leaves the 99 sheep and goes and chases after that one lost sheep it's so important to him that's why the woman who lost one coin will just forget about all the nine and search and search and search until he finds that one lost coin there's rejoicing in heaven father we thank you thank you oh god who are we that lord you have entrusted to us this message this ministry of reconciliation Father, we pray that you grant us grace. Grant us grace, O oh God, that we'll always be mindful of this charge, of this commission that you've given to us. And that will not be found wanting. In that same mood of prayer we want to get ready to take our communion tonight the Bible says and Paul speaking in 1st Corinthians 11 verse 23 he says that for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself on the night when he was betrayed the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it then he broke it in pieces and said this is my body this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he took the cup of wine after supper saying this cup is the new covenant between God and his people an agreement confirmed with my blood do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again tonight we want to announce the Lord's death so anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord that is why we should examine ourselves before eating the bread and drinking the cup 
For if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon ourselves. And so very briefly, before we take it, we just want to examine ourselves. I love the song our lady sang, Purify my heart, let me be as gold and as precious silver. Refine as fire, my heart's one desire is to be holy and set apart for you, ready to do your will. Let's pray and ask God to purify our hearts tonight from every filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit as we come before the Lord tonight. And say that we are announcing God's death. We are announcing his death. We are doing it in obedience to his command, yes. But for us, it's a living sign of Christ's sacrifice upon the cross, which he made for us. And so taking the bread and the wine gives us a renewed assurance of the forgiveness of our sins and a renewed hope to live as his witness in this world shall we take the bread re representing the body of Christ and as we are taking it it's not just giving us an assurance and a renewed hope it's also healing our bodies so if you have any sickness this is medicine for our bodies as well shall we take the bread okay shall we take the the blood the, the wine representing the blood of Jesus there's power in the blood and as we take it let's take it in faith that it's doing something in our bodies in Jesus name shall we take the blood shall we pray Heavenly Father we thank you Thank you for the privilege, O oh God, even to obey this command, to do this in remembrance of him. Father, for us, it's a living sign of his sacrifice, even on the cross. Thank you for his death and his resurrection, which has saved us, justified us, glorified us, and given us a place amongst the saints thank you God that there's power in the sacrament and thank you oh God that it's working even in us tonight thank you that every fear is gone Thank you that every pain is disappeared. Thank you that every disease is removed from our bodies. Thank you, God, that every disorder is brought back into order in the name of Jesus. Thank you that every hold of the enemy over any life here is broken in Jesus' name. Thank you for the fullness of the Spirit. Thank you for the fresh oil of your anointing. We thank you, O oh God, for Jesus. We move in him, we live in him, we have our being in him, O oh God. Thank you that God, this communion unites us as one. For the spirit is living inside everyone here. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the message. Visit us on www.harvestinternationalministries.org. 
send us an email through office at harvestinternationalministries.org or call us on 0302-222-372 or 0302-229-109. God bless you.